Hey, so good to be with you. Uh, so good to be invited back. It's been a while. Thought I must have said something wrong last time, but uh, here we are in bright Lismore. What a great place. Great place. Driving, we were a bit early this morning, and so we drove through the hills and went the back way, and what a magnificent landscape it is around here, eh? It's almost as good as the Gold Coast. But I really do want to echo what Terry said and honour your pastors and all of you for who's believing for God to do great things. Now, honestly, uh, Terry just said she had something to speak. I'm not going to let her speak anymore because now I've got to lift my game. Uh, but I just really believe God just wants to do something in, in our midst this morning. I was, uh, I was standing next to Jordan here in worship. And did you notice he was getting further and further away from me? It's got, it's got something to do with my voice, I'm sure. But you know, we're singing this song, so I'm not going to try and sing to you, that, you, I promise you. But even as Terry said that song, uh, let all the redeemed, something like this, prophesy and sing. We can hear the wind blowing. It's like a nice song, isn't it? But I want to say this, we've got to prophesy and sing. We've got to hear the wind blowing. If God's people don't listen for the wind, who's going to listen for the wind? I mean, I've been thinking through John chapter 3, where Jesus even talks to Nicodemus about the whole story about being born again. And he said, where the spirit moves, it's like the wind. No one knows where it comes from. We've just seen where it's been. We see the, the, how, how it touches people's lives. And Jesus is there speaking about how one gets born again. But I believe that this nation needs to be born again. I believe that we need a wind of God over this nation like never before. And uh, I've got to be very honest with you. Uh, like Kate this morning, I'll tell the truth. Um, I mean, there, there are times in recent years that I have found it difficult to prophesy about a wind of God. Have you noticed that this nation <laughs> is in trouble? Really? I, I got to the place in my life and, and I do a lot of leadership teaching and I do a lot of church building and I have done for decades now. But, but I've been coming to the place that, my God, if you don't move on our nation, the evil in our nation, the mindset of our nation, the, the antichrist spirit over our nation. And sometimes you can get overwhelmed with that, hey. And that's why I believe that we need to be a people that continue to speak the life of God over our city, over our families, over our nation, because I believe with all of my heart that God wants to move. I mean, I believe, you know, why? Not because Gary wants him to move, but because God so loved the world that He sent His only Son. And as I've been reading of late of the history of revivals around the world and even in our nation, I believe that God is so moved by the, by the heart of man, the state of man that He wants to move upon our nation again. How many have ever heard of the great South land of the Holy Spirit? I mean, we've got to believe it again. And I just want to encourage you, <clears throat> even as <clears throat> excuse me, Terry was speaking this morning, is to let's be a people that prophesy the wind of God over our place. Let's not be like I was and get so, uh, so overwhelmed by the state of things. Because God moves when there is no answer. God, we sing the songs, don't we? About the power of God, but I'm believing. You know, I was reading recently just a book on revival. If you're interested, it's called, the Great, it's called Great Southland Revival. It's just a, a story of revivals from Acts up until Australian settlement and then what God's done in our nation. You know, I was reading, because when we talk about revival, we, talk about, we think about Billy Graham and hundreds of thousands of people, don't we? But I'm reading stories of, of God turning up in backwater places in the middle of nowhere, Aboriginal settlements where God moves on a community and all of a sudden the police have got nothing to do because the heart of man has been turned back to God. How many believe if he's done it before, he can do it again? That he wants us to speak of the things of God that we can believe in Lismore. We can believe in Ganalaba, wherever that is. <laughs> it's high and dry in Ganalaba. You're in the right place in how, how many believe that God so loves our cities that He wants to move? 
on the hearts of people. I'm reminded again in Scripture, and this is all, by the way, I'll get to my message in a minute. But, you know, I'm reminded that, that, that the Son of God was manifest to destroy the works of the enemy. I'm reminded in my Bible that where sin abounds, how many know sin abounds? But grace abounds much more. How many believe that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world? Sometimes we can be overcome by what is happening around us rather than to be prophesying the wind of God over our city. Could we believe that a rise church could arise and be that prophetic voice over our city, wherever we are? Maybe. Better get to the word of God. I don't have to be anywhere this afternoon, so I've got all day, all right, so it's okay. <laughs> Let me remind you a couple of things this morning, uh, just in this vein. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45, Paul tells us this. He says, so it is written, the first Adam, that's the Genesis Adam, became a living being, received the breath of God and, be, and, and, and lived from nothing. But the last Adam... I hope you all know who the last Adam is. When the Bible talks about the second or the last Adam, it's talking about Christ himself. And Christ didn't become a living being. He became a life-giving spirit. I want to talk about a life-giving spirit. I want to talk about a life-giving church today in Jesus' name. Amen. How many believe we need life? We need the life of God to flow in our cities. So, John chapter 4, I'm just going to share a few scriptures with you and we'll see where we go. John chapter 4 is a story, many of you that have been around will know what it's about. It's about a, a woman, they call it the woman at the well. I probably prefer to think it's not so much the woman at the well, it's what, what happened to the woman at the well when she encountered a life-giving spirit when she encountered the person of Jesus Christ. Here is a woman that I believe represents the world today, represented the world then and represents the world today. She was broken. How many know there's broken people all around about us? She was broken by her own wayward living. She was broken by being outcast from society because of her wayward living. She was so broken she couldn't even go and draw water when everybody else did because she was so full of pain and shame because of what the enemy had done, what she had done and others had done to her life. How many know that represents a lot of people in this world today? They're broken and they're looking for water. I believe it with all my heart. They're, they're, they're looking, they're searching. They don't know where to search. And she encounters at this well. I encourage you to read the whole story for yourself. She encounters this man called Jesus. And the New Living Version of the Bible says this. Jesus replies to her as she's inquiring about water. Anyone who drinks this water from this well will become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh, bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Anyone who drinks, anybody here drunk of that water? Have anybody drunk of the water of Jesus? I would say probably most of us have. And if you haven't by now, then you can this morning. You can right now drink of Jesus Christ by receiving him into your life. But here's Jesus. He says, anybody who drinks this water, anybody who comes to me and drinks this water, it becomes a fresh, bubbling spring. How's your bubble? How's your bubble going? You're all looking pretty serious. Not much bubbling going on around here this morning. I've got to be honest. A lot of times in my life, there's not much bubble. It's like someone's put a cork in my spring. It's like I'm going through the motions, but there's not much life. 
And I want to encourage us today that if you're in Christ, there's a spring in you. There's a bubble that wants to come out of you. There is a a river, a stream, a flow that God wants to bring into your life and through your life in Jesus' name. How many? You know, I, and I'm I'm as guilty as anybody, we we can't, here's the deal. We can't stop the spring source. That's Christ. But we can cork it up. We can cork it up with the ways of the world. We can cork it up with unbelief. We can cork it up with religion. We can cork it up with so many things that this thing that Jesus says, if you come to me, if you drink of me, there will be a bubbling spring. Do you know what the purpose of a spring is? The purpose of a spring is to fertilize, to bring life to the surrounding area. Terry just went over to a month or six weeks ago to uh, teach in our Bible college in the Solomon Islands. They didn't invite me to that one either. But anyway, she was over there and, and, and it's a dry land. It's a hot land. It's a dry land. But underneath the Bible college is a spring. What does that spring do? Where there's no water. In the arid surrounds, they can come and they draw from that spring and it brings life to everybody around them. Amen. Our spring, the Bible, the word spring or the or the purpose or the real word or concept of a spring means something. Have a listen to this. That is continually flowing and self-replenishing. Jesus said the spring in us, the life that he brings to us is continually flowing and self-replenishing. Aren't you glad that when you came to church today, you don't have to go on the same stale water that you came to last week? It's fresh today. It can be. Religion can have me flowing with the water or drawing of the water that I drew yesterday or last week or last month or last year. But when I am built on the spring of Jesus Christ, this thing doesn't stop flowing. It wants to bubble out of me. It wants to bubble in me. It wants to bring life and eternal life to me. But where I really want to go this morning is the purpose of this spring isn't just to bring life to us. It's to bring life through us. I've got a bubbling going on here this morning. I don't know, I'll just have a party. I'm having a bubbling going on here this morning because I believe, as, I'm, as I've been stirred in recent months about this, that Gary, your life isn't just about making it to the end. Your life is about making a difference. Your life is about helping broken people like the woman at the well find water that's not only going to refresh them, but it's going to bubble in them. I'm going to get some brooks flowing in this place this morning. I'm going to, I'm going to get some bubbling going on here. Hey, I'm going. I want, I want to just maybe look at, the, at some thoughts about water and the flow of water through Scripture. Jesus, again, as I started to meditate on this and started to read on this, I, so many times the Bible talks about or, or, or the Bible represents the work and the freshness and the life of God through water that flows. In John 7, him, Jesus himself again said this in verse 37 and 38. On the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, if anyone thirsts, who's thirsty? If anyone thirsts. Don't you love the all-inclusivity of that word? Anyone. Anyone thirsts. A woman at the well, five husbands, living with someone, she was thirsty. Jesus didn't have any sort of hoops that she had to just come and drink. If you're thirsty here this morning, there is life for you here right now. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers rivers of living water. You know, if you go right back to the very, very start, the book of Genesis, 
The Bible says in the book of Genesis, and I haven't got the scripture up here, it says, it says uh, now a river went out from Eden before sin entered the world. God created a river that flowed from Eden. And out of that garden of life that God had created, out of that place of Eden flowed a river that then divided into four great rivers. And the whole purpose of the river was to, was to fertilize and to bring life to the earth around. God's plan is to bring life. Man, don't you hate religion? Religion wants to kill us. Has as Pastor L said this morning, is, is we don't have to jump through heaps. We don't have to do anything. He's done it all. He wants life to flow. And so then obviously what happens, it all got mucked up. You know, you notice when man does things, man mucks things up. So this river flows. It's meant to bring life. Adam and Eve sinned and the river went swampy, went stagnant. It stopped flowing. And then all of this ramification of the fall of man happened. Culminating then, as we get into the book of Exodus, we see the people of Exodus, or the people of Israel in slavery, and God brings them out. And do you remember that they few days out of the into the promised land, or as they are going through the wilderness, they're thirsty. There's nothing to drink. God brings them to a rock. And what's He say? The rock. Strike the rock. The Bible actually says water started to flow. What did the water do for God's people? Bring refreshment. Quenched the thirst. Brought life to thirsty people. And it's not stopped flowing since. Then, of course, Jesus comes. And it's really interesting because the Bible there says that on the last day of the great feast, the feast is actually the Feast of Tabernacles. And what they would do during this feast, it was a feast to celebrate what God had done in the wilderness, how God had brought them through. went for seven days. And particularly for them to celebrate the, the God bringing forth water from the rock. What they would do is they'd go to the pool of Siloam for seven days, and they would get jugs, they would draw jugs of water from the spring, and they'd walk back to the temple, and they would pour it out onto the ground as a drink offering. What a crazy thing to do, pour the water out as a drink offering, um, uh, to, to, sell, to, to, mem to, to remember all that God had done. You know what I find funny? Here they are drawing water, from this pool to remember what God did. Everybody was probably thirsty while they did it. And here's the source of life watching them do it. He's watching them pour this water out. He's watching them remember what he did thousands of years before. And he's standing there all the time. And he says, hey, guys, pull it up here. Pull it up here. You don't have to draw water from, a, from a, a natural pool. Come to me and drink. Come to me. They're all thirsty and pouring the water out. Jesus said, come and drink from me and out of you will flow rivers of living water. How do you see yourself today? Do you see yourself potentially as a conduit for the life of God to flow to all those around you? Or do you see yourself as someone taking up space hoping to get to heaven when it's all over? Or do you see yourself as somebody that might probably like me want to shrink back and hide from all the mess that's going on around the world because we're not convinced that this river will flow through you. It's really important how we see ourselves. Jesus said, you will be like a bubbling spring. Kate, even when it's tough, even when those kids have to have book week, I love book week. I think book week is awesome. I'm a grandparent. I just get the photos of book week. 
I think they're brilliant. I don't have to come up with anything. I got four grandkids. Look at all these beautiful photos. I don't know what you're whinging about, Kate. <laughs> but even when it's a tough week at the office, even when things aren't going so good, are we subject to what's going around? Or like Kate, are we drawing on the Holy Spirit, not just to comfort ourselves, but to see ourselves as a conduit to life that for those around about us? So important. So important, I've got to change how I view this. But you know, even this, the Holy Spirit will, will, will quench my thirst, but it's not all about me. It's about being this bubbling spring that brings life to those around about me. Some of you aren't convinced. Otherwise, you'd look a lot happier. You'd look a lot more excited. I mean, I'm, I mean is, is Jesus' words true or not? Did he say, if you drink of me? Do we believe that? He said, if you come and drink, you're going you're gonna to have a good time. That's going to be awesome. But rivers of living water will flow out of you for what purpose? To heal those around about you. To take it to the women at the well, wherever they may be, school, play, sport, work, doesn't really matter. But to take the river of God, the life of God to the people around about us. Man, I want to be part of that, hey? I want, to, I want to get away from all the things that consume me and say, God, let the river of God flow through my life. I've got a 45 points here that I just want to share with you. Some of you might have been around a while and you've, you've heard of this river that's flowed from a temple and, and Ezekiel prophetically speaks of the river of God, of the flow of God. And I want to just go there for a few minutes today uh, and to just to point some things out about this, this life, this life flow of God through, uh, I believe, to our nation. I am just, I'm believing God wants to move on our nation powerfully. I'm not wishing it. I believe it. I believe it. Your pastor wrote a, wrote a, a, a whatever you write on Facebook. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm more normally praying rather than on Facebook. But, you know, some of us have got a bit of catching up to do. Um, but I don't know if you read his Facebook post this week about digging wells. You know, we've we got to re... Our whole conference a, a month or so ago was about redigging wells. Why? Why have why, why we got to redig wells? Because, friends, it's not that there's no water down there. It's things stop the wells flowing. The same thing here with these bubbling springs. It's not that the springs aren't bubbling and flowing, is we let things stop them up. And I'm as, I'm as guilty as anybody. I let things stop up my wells. I let busyness at work. I let problems. I let sin. I let fear. I let all this stuff stop up my wells. And I believe the encouragement of the Holy Spirit in this day and age is church. You've got to unstop the wells. You've got to start the bubbling going again. You've got to let the river of God use you, flow through you, because you carry life. You, carry, you don't carry religion. You don't carry condemnation to the world around. We're not here to preach how bad the world is. We're here to preach how much life Jesus wants to bring to that world. He's the source of that life. So Ezekiel says this in verses 1 and 2. He says, He brought me back to the door of the temple, and there was water flowing from under the threshold of the temple towards the east, for the front of the temple faced east. The water was flowing from under the right side of the temple, south of the altar. He brought me out by way of the north gate and he led me around to the outside of the outer gate that faces east. And there was water running where? Running out. Just a couple of points about uncorking maybe, unstopping these wells. Terry has already said it this morning. She stole my message. She read my notes while I was driving on the way down. But... Or maybe God was saying some things. But we've got to make sure we're built on the spring. The source. See, the church for too long has thought that the church is the source. The church is the conduit. The church is the vehicle. The source is Christ himself. The Bible says, you know what? It was not even, even, even idol temples, but, but also temple, the, the temple of, of God was built literally on a spring. It was representative 
of what God has built the church on. Who's the temple of the Holy Spirit? Now the church is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And as in the days of old, they would build these temples on springs because it was figuratively representing where the life was coming from, from the temple. But the point is this, the, 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 the significance isn't that it's built on the temple, it's built on the rock of Christ Himself. The rock that was smitten, the rock that went to the cross, the rock that took our sin and our pain and our failures, and it flows from Him. Friends, if we want to be a river that flows to the world around us, first and foremost, we must be focused on Him who is the source. The more I look at Him, the more I reflect Him. What is it? One of the epistles to the Corinthians tells us that we're being transformed from glory to glory as we what? Gaze upon Him. Not as we fix our lives up, not as we get more holy. As we gaze upon Him, the source, something happens in us. And you know what? The more life flows out of me when I spend more time with Jesus. When I'm gazing upon Jesus, when I'm thinking, I was thinking about it on the way down, no wonder my driving's terrible. I get all these thoughts. And I'm thinking, I'm just a better person when I'm looking at Jesus. I'm just more likely to have words of life come from me when I've been spending time with Jesus. I know I've got a bunch of mates that I, I catch up with a few times a week. We do a lot of paddling and stuff like that. And most of them are lost as geese in blizzards. But I just know that I'm more effective talking life to them when I've been close to Jesus. I've got to build it on the spring. I've got to let the spring flow to me before it can flow through me in Jesus' name. So first and foremost, who wants the life of Christ to flow through you? Gaze upon Him. Build your life on the rock. Spend time in the quiet place. The, if we are habitually feeding on Christ, we cannot avoid exhibiting Him and His character to the world around about us. Amen? Amen. 101. But I want you to see yourself as more than just someone sitting on a pew this morning. You're a channel. Ezekiel goes on and he says, <clears throat> And when the man went out to the east with the line in his hand, he measured a thousand cubits and he brought, I should get an updated version of the Bible, shouldn't we? I don't know what a cubit is even to this day. And he brought me through the waters and the water came up to my ankles. And again, he measured a thousand more and it came up to my knees. And again, he measured a thousand more and it came up to my waist. And again, he measured a thousand and a river. And it was a river that I could not cross for the water was too deep. Water in which one must swim, a river that could not be crossed. If we believe this water, this spirit, this life is the answer to the world around about us, we're not going to fix anything in church. This is shallow water. It actually says, one of the actual versions of the Bible says that, that when the water went out from the temple, it trickled. But the further out it got, it got deeper and deeper and deeper. Friends, if we're going to see revival, the Holy Spirit change the hearts of our communities, we've got to get out into the deep where they live. I said before, I, I paddle a bit, not very well, but I paddle ocean skis. And uh, a few months ago, I was getting a little bit frustrated with uh, my... Ability. A friend of mine says, often he says, I just run out of talent. Didn't get that anyway. <laughs> but anyway, I'll, I'll explain it to you later. 
These ocean skis that I paddle, they're, they're built for what we call downwinding, running wind swell out in the ocean, you know. But it's pretty dangerous out there sometimes. And I was getting a little bit frustrated with my ability. So the, the one, one day, a few months ago, blokes, they rang me up and said, we're going for a downwind this afternoon. I said, great, I'm in. It's blowing 45 kilometres an hour, white caps everywhere. We go about 15k south and we run these southerly things. Now, I'd never been out in 45 kilometres an hour before, man, and I am scared to flipping death, I've got to tell you. I'm, just, I'm doing it because I'm stubborn. All right, so I go out there and we get out a couple of k's and we turn and we're running these things and, man, was it a hoot that I have a good time in the middle of being petrified. I was petrified, but I was having a good time at the same time. But here's the thing. If I wanted to experience the power of the wind and the waves, I had to get out where the water was deep and the wind was blowing. And the more I, and I, I fell out and I fell over and I had all sorts of stuff. Don't worry about that. But here's the deal. If we want to see the power, we've got to get out to where the water needs to be deep, where people are living. Who's, who's seen the movie... Well, no, the series, The Chosen. A couple of us. I tell you what, do yourself a favor. It's awesome. Get it. But there's a scene in the last series that I really, I really loved. You, you know when it says that Jesus sent the disciples out two by two? He said, go heal the sick and raise the dead and do these miracles and all this stuff. And in my head, right, and then they came back. And they marveled at all they saw God do, right? In my mind, I was always thinking they went out full of confidence, full of power, full of faith, full of Jesus is going to do all these miracles. And that's how I thought. So because they're, they're the disciples, you know, they're, they're, they're these guys. And this, this chosen corrected me. They went out and didn't have a clue what was going to happen. They went out. It was almost they were fighting. There's these scenes. They were arguing each, with each other about who should pray. I don't know what he's going to do. This person's lame. I don't know what to do. Jesus sort of said, do it, so let's do it. And, and, and people were healed. And they were, they were more surprised than the people that got healed. They were more surprised. Hey, guys, I'm going to encourage you to get out into the deep, but don't think you're going to know what's going to happen out there. That's where God meets us. When we don't know what's going to happen. And here's big bravado Peter. And he's laying hands on people like, oh, I don't know what to do. He's looking at me. And, and then God turns up in his power. Not to make Peter look good. But to heal people who are thirsty. We've got to be prepared. How many believe you go out there with a heart full of faith, with a heart full of life, into the deep, God just might use the life in you to touch the life of a thirsty person. Number three, maybe we could have the musicians, please. I've already said this one. We must, I've said it over and over, we must see ourselves as channels of life to heal the land. Have a listen to Ezekiel, as he goes on, in verse 6, he says to me, Son of man, have you seen this? When he brought me and returned to the bank of the river, when I returned there, I want you to catch this. Along the bank of the river were very many trees on one side and the other. And he said to me, this water flows towards the eastern region, goes down into the valley, enters the sea. When it reaches the sea, its waters are healed. And that shall be that everything, every living thing that moves, wherever the rivers go, will live. Will live. Lismore, where the river goes, will live. Where the bubbling spring in you goes, Things will live that were dead. Women at wells will receive life again. People lost in sin and shame. People lost in drug addictions. People lost in family breakups. 
people who have had no parents, they will, I prophesy this this morning, they live. Where the river goes, they live. It shall be that the fishermen will stand by it in in Gedi and in Eglaim. There will be places for spreading their nets. Their fish will be be of the same kinds of fish of the great sea, exceedingly many. Its swamps and marshes will not be healed. But along the bank of the river, on this side and that, will grow all kinds of trees used for food. Leaves will not weather, wither. Fruit will not fail. They will bear fruit every month because the water flows from the sanctuary. The fruit will be for food and their leaves will be for medicine. We must regard ourselves as this channel of life. And God's heart, I'm praying, I'm prophesying that the wind of God would blow over our nation. But I'm not just asking God to do it. I got to be prepared to see myself as a channel, a channel of life to go and work with God where there's a woman at the well, where there's a mess in the world. I've got to believe that the power of the Holy Spirit, that the life in this bubbling spring will come with me in Jesus' name. I've got to believe I'm a channel of God's love and of God's grace and His mercy and of His life to the world around about me. We are. This sea that Ezekiel speaks of, this river literally flows to the Dead Sea. You know why they call it the Dead Sea? Because nothing lives. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I look at the world around about me and I think, how can anything live? So evil, so anti-God, so much wrong. Governments going the other way. Things we were, things that when I went into ministry 30 years ago, I wouldn't, were unspeakable things. I wouldn't even think about them. And yet that's the way. And I look at the nation and I say, surely, surely it's dead. But then I look at the river. Then I look at the word of God. And even as the prophet Ezekiel is prophesied in this, in, in this Old Testament passage, God, I believe, is speaking to us today. That even though it may look dead, that dead sea looked dead, nothing lived. But God says where this river, where this river of life flows, everything will live. Every living thing will live. We will have harvest. We will have a harvest of souls. I speak it over Lismore today. I believe it today. We will push back where things look dead. Our families look dead. Our children look dead in Christ. But God will come and bring the river of life and they shall live in Jesus' name. The river. The river. Why don't we stand this morning? I was joking about having all day. Two more things. I started with this. And so it is written. The first Adam became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Arise, Church Lismore. Does the life-giving spirit have hold of us? Do we see ourselves not as the source of life, but do we see ourselves as channels of a life that so loved the world that He gave up His life that whoever would believe in Him, whoever would drink of Him, would not only receive life, but they would become a channel of His life to the world around about Him. Gary Hurrigan believes more than ever that I'm a channel. I'm a channel 
I'm a channel of the life of God. I can block that up. I can let fear stop me. I can let religion, I can let waywardness, I can let any number of things stop that, that, that or, or block that spring. But today I choose by faith to unblock it. I choose to identify the things that are stopping me. Fear of going out into the deep, not spending enough time gazing on the Son of God, not seeing myself as an answer to this world's problems, but seeing myself as someone who hides from this world's problems no more. I see myself. I see myself. I see myself. as a conduit for this life-giving Spirit. Jesus said again in John chapter 6, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. I don't know most of you here this morning. don't know where you stand with God. I've spoken a lot about this life that He brings to us if we will drink of, believe in His Son by faith. This passage I just read right now, Jesus Himself declared Himself to be the bread of life. And to receive this life, you've got to do one thing. One thing. He who believes in me. He who believes in me. Maybe you came here today, somebody bought you. I don't know how you got here. You wandered in. My question, my encouragement, my admonition, my pleading with you today would be to put your faith in Jesus Christ. Not so that you can join a church, although that's a very, very good and sensible thing to do. But so that you may never thirst. That you may have a a spring, a continually flowing and self-replenishing spring flowing through you and to you in Jesus' name. I'm going to ask that we all do this right now. Why don't we open ourselves up to that life-giving spirit right now? Father God, those of us that know you, those of us that maybe not, those of you, those of us, whose springs might be blocked. We come to you again this morning, or we come to you for the first time this morning. And first and foremost, we declare that we believe in you. Just do that out of your spirit right now. I believe in you, Jesus. Out of your spirit, young or old, out of your sp- I believe in you, Jesus. I believe you came to bring life to me. And I believe you came to bring life through me. And so, Father, today, as eyes are closed and people are praying, this is what I believe God wants to do just for a few minutes. He wants you to ask yourself, how much bubble is really going on? How much bubble? When I get up on Monday morning, how much do I sense the life of God to me and through me? How much bubble? I've got to be honest, a lot of times there's not much bubble in my own life. That's okay. God doesn't condemn me for that. He says, come back to me right now. Because my spring, his, 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 my spring is continually flowing and self-replenishing. <laughs> I don't have to make this thing flow. I just got to unstop it. Father, right now, just, just show us how much bubble we have and what are the things that are stopping us. I break fear in the name of Jesus. There are ones here today that you don't share much about Jesus because fear has got you stopped. I break that in the name of Jesus. God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of a sound mind. And I break that in the name of Jesus. I'm going to just say a few things right now. And if you want prayer for them, please come. I'm not going to labour this. But you know that fear, fear from getting out into the deep, fear from sharing your faith, fear from believing that God wants to flow through you. I break that in the name of Jesus. 
habit patterns that come around our own life that stop the flow of God. Right now, I don't want, I don't want to know what they are. I just want you to identify and say, God, I uncork this thing right now. I let you take this thing out of my life right now. Would you flow through me right now in Jesus' name? Religion, religion will stop it flowing. Religion, oh, with the thou shalt and the thou shalt nots, that'll stop it flowing. We are a source of not condemnation to the world, but life to the world. Hurt, pain, selfishness, all things. Father, right now, right now, right now, let all the redeemed prophesy and sing. I can hear a wind blowing. Come on, do you see it? Your family? You're willing to prophesy over your family right now? I can see a wind blowing. Your workplace? I can see a wind blowing. I'm a conduit to the Spirit of God. If you want prayer for anything like this this morning, just come, let me lay hands on you. If you know that things are blocking this flow in your life, just, just come, we'll pray for you. We won't ask any questions. We'll just pray for you in Jesus' name. Oh, Father God, right now, we unblock them. We unblock them. We unblock them. Go back and read your pastor's Facebook blog this week. Redig the wells that would stop the flow of God. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. You need prayer. You come. It's so important we unblock these. So important. Do you see yourself? I break I just feel to speak against fear, unbelief, unbelief that we could actually be a conduit. There are some of you saying, God, that's everybody else. How could you use me? If he can use Gary, if he could use Peter, if he could use James, he can use you. We just got to get out of the way and let his life come to us and through us. Holy Spirit, come on, block us. Come and move anything out of the way, Lord. Lord, right now, give me boldness. I just got a sense boldness is going to come over people right now. Boldness to share. Not because of how good you are, but a confidence. Here's the thing. Hopefully what I've been able to do this morning is to give you a confidence that Jesus wants to flow through you. You don't have to be anything special. He wants you to put your confidence in Him, in you, in Jesus' mighty name. I'm going to pass to to Pastor L. We're going to pray for those out the front. Thank you so much for having us here today. But just for a minute or two, just stay in this this attitude of prayer and worship and, and see the fire of God in your spirit, man. Touch this nation and this city. In Jesus' name.